He loved this place. He just adored it. Like, perfect. It's hard to put it into context, but all the people you see around nowadays, they simply weren't there then. So it was very private, very hidden away, even though it's right in the centre. And so it was like a little, you know, place to sort of escape from everything. It hasn't changed at all. It's exactly the same. You look out of the window, you see the same architecture. The windows are the same. Everything is the same. The height of the ceilings, the beam, they're all the same. So it hasn't changed. The first time I met Jimmy uh, was when I was in the restaurant because I used to handle the music when I was there. And I was playing a record uh, by Muddy Waters called Electric Mud and it echoed up the stairs. Uh, when you walked down the stairs, you could hear the, all the music from the restaurants. And uh, as he came past the window, he looked in and smiled. And then he came in the restaurant and said to me, what's that record you're playing? And I, I brought out and showed him the cover of Mud Muddy Waters. And he was really surprised because he'd been copying Muddy Waters sort of music or being influenced by it for so many years. And this record was Muddy Waters copying Hendrix. It was really um, an electric album that he made. And uh, so we started talking about music and he looked through the albums that I had and they were mostly blues albums that I had there. And uh, we were comparing notes on who we liked and who we didn't like. And he asked me if he could borrow a couple of albums and I said, sure. And um, he borrowed a Howling Wolf album called Big City Blues, I think it was, and another one by Omar James. And uh, I found out there somewhere in Seattle's museum now, so I couldn't bring myself to go and ask for them back. <laughs> it just wasn't cool. <laughs> he wrote all the time, and he tried everything out all the time, so a lot of music was made here, and a lot of writing went on here. But he was a fabulous musician. When you see people jumping up and want to play with him, you, you know, people, internationally known musicians, you know that something's special. People like Roland Rashon Kirk played here, George Harrison. We had a washer-up um, who worked for us, a Canadian guy, and he just used to sleep where and whenever. And he, a lot of the times he used to sleep on the stairs leading up to Jimmy's flat because it was dark and, and it was quite warm there. And he used to come down the next day and he would say to us, you'll never guess who trod on my head last night. It was George Harrison. <laughs> and he would be so thrilled. And it would be like a who's who of who'd trod on him walking down the stairs about two or three o'clock in the morning, you know. We had small gatherings of people that we knew played, you know, music. And if the, do if the downstairs door was shut, they just used to shout up from the other side of the street. If we could hear them, great. If we couldn't, they'd have to telephone us, go and find a phone box, phone us. We just used to throw the keys down so they could let themselves in. Interesting time because I was busy every day. Maybe we did the shoot, I think, um, in the after later afternoon. We were here for a couple of hours just chatting with Jimmy and uh, talking about everything under the sun, what was he interested in. And he started telling us about um, Handel, he said, lived next door or somewhere. And he wasn't quite sure, but he, he heard these vibrations late at night coming through. and. Uh, then he went out and bought Handel's Messiah and the water music and going, wow, man, this is great. Jimmy was very spiritual and, and he actually thought that maybe, it may, you know, maybe he's in here, you know, his spirit or his musical spirit, Handel's musical spirit was still here. He was very pleasant, very easy to get on with. You know, I met him a few times before and shot pictures and he was very humble, very... Um, no, Eric Clapton, man, he's a, the he's a best guitar player. And Eric was saying, no, no, Jimmy's the best guitar player. He was genuinely surprised when he saw Jimmy. I don't think he'd ever seen anything like it. And, you know, Eric's fairly talented, to say the least. He was just a brilliant player. And um, I remember saying to him at uh, some point during the interview, um, yeah, Jimmy, I saw you play the other week. And uh, I don't know, man, it was magic that seemed to be as if I didn't. He said, well, sometimes when you get in the groove, you know, that uh, the guitar is, am I playing the guitar, the guitar's playing me, you're just taken over by uh, that creative spirit and it just flows. And uh, that was Jimmy, he just flew, flew, flow, flowed with, <laughs> with stuff. It was magic, you know. One of my favourites, I should say, is uh, All Along the Watchtower. And that was not even one of Jimmy's songs. He didn't even write that one, that was Bob Dylan's. But he completely changed it his own composition, it was his own 
something and he made it up as he went along. No? He had a vague idea of where he went, where he wanted to go with it. But it wasn't until he was in the studio that he went the way he did and we all stood up and went Wah! When he first picked up a guitar, <laughs> frightened the daylights out of the people there because they'd never heard anything like it. Quite amazing. Well, that particular pedal, or the concept of that pedal, it, well, it was revolutionary and, and still is revolutionary in as much that it provides uh, what might be thought of as like a mirror image of the, of, of the actual sound, you know? So, uh, yeah, it, uh, if, if frequency doubles the sound, then that's what gives you the uh, very flute-like um, extended uh, harmonic response that you can hear, you know, not only on, uh, say, Purple Haze and Fire, but obviously on the Band of Gypsies and, and other records that he used it on. But his music is as relevant today as it was, ever was and it always will be. Great musicians live on.